there's not much Professor Nikolai Petrovsky has been wrong about. In fact, it would be hard to think of anything for that matter. And with the COVID-19 origins debate flowering up again, as one of the first scientists to actually address the topic with science and not speculation or politics, it's interesting to see just how right Professor Petrovsky's original findings have been. Join us to discuss just whether or not his thoughts and beliefs were accurate with the benefit of hindsight, even though they were made with foresight. We're welcoming Professor Petrovsky back again. Welcome, Professor. It's a pleasure. Now, the first obvious question is how right were you? And do you think your findings are more accurate than the supposed experts of the world were offering up? Look, I don't think it's about right or wrong because, because you know, all we did was describe our findings, um, which were that, that this new COVID-19 virus was, was exquisitely adapted to infect humans um, rather than, than other animals. And obviously that finding in itself um, has been now supported over three years by many other um, research groups who have looked at it in different ways. They all very consistently find the same. No one's ever actually found any data that contradicted that. So, so our findings per se, I think, have stood the test of time um, and scrutiny and, and reproduction. What that finding means, we, we ourselves don't know. Um, we, we obviously um, looked at how could that have happened? You know, what are the different possible scenarios? And, and of course, one of them would be it was just a billion to one chance. Um, normally, new viruses in humans are, are not well adapted to humans, as you might expect. They haven't seen human cells before. Yes, there's a one in a trillion chance that that could have just been a fluke. Um, the other possibility, which we you know thought was a, a more realistic probability, um, was that in some way this virus had already had an opportunity to adapt to humans or at least to human cells um, before it was described in you know November two thousand and nineteen. So we then went and thought, well, how could that happen? Either it was circulating in humans, um, you know, and no one knew about it um, pre-2019. And, uh, you know, there was no evidence for that. And in fact, you know, the Chinese had done surveys in old samples and they found no evidence of that. We've looked in, in old samples ourselves and, and, and find no evidence of that. So, so that I think we can pretty well exclude that possibility. The only other logical possibility that a virus could have adapted to humans without actually having infected humans previously is that you know we maintain human cells in cultures in laboratories and we use those for experiments with viruses and we can actually show we can very rapidly adapt a virus and evolve a virus to infect human cells doing those types of experiments so so the natural question then became well was was such experiments being done you know, on um, these types of viruses with human cells. Um, and in fact, you know, there's, there's papers published and we know for sure that, yes, these experiments, types of experiments were, were not only being considered, but were being done routinely in laboratories in China that were very close within kilometres to the initial reported outbreak. So, of course, that, that had to become a a very serious possibility, the idea that this virus evolved and, and was accidentally released from a laboratory experiment. And, and so we just put it forward as plausible. We didn't say it's certain. Uh, we just said, look, this, this is, has to be taken seriously and, and investigated further. And, you know, initially, obviously, um, there, there was a lot of, um, I guess, um, political manipulation um, in the early days of this pandemic that tried to suggest that, that that possibility was not only, you know, almost certainly not the case, 
but that anyone even daring to raise that possibility, you know, had to be considered a conspiracy theorist and a crackpot. Um, you know, that, that, that was pretty hurtful because, you know, again, that, it, that theory just came out of our findings and, and we weren't putting it forward for any reason other than we couldn't see many other explanations um, for our data. We certainly, I don't consider myself a crackpot. Uh, I don't consider myself a conspiracy theorist. I consider myself a serious scientist with, with really, you know, strong data that, that raised this possibility of the virus having come out of a laboratory. And I think, you know, it's, it, it's nice to be vindicated three years later by increasing number of official bodies who are slowly coming out um, and, and saying that they similarly, um, you know, consider this to be a, a, a significant possibility. Again, no one has the definitive answer. But, you know, when you look at all of the data, all the circumstantial evidence, um, you know, you, you have to say this is a very, a possibility that has to be taken extremely seriously. And, and, um, and as I say, it, it's nice to finally have come full circle and, and, and sort of be, have that position endorsed by some official bodies at least. Yeah. Um, and as you mentioned, you're not a crackpot, you're not a conspiracy, conspiracy theorist. You're one of Australia's leading scientists, a vaccinologist, with a COVID vaccine already in use overseas, vaccines are your jam. This is where you go. So you're not anti-vax. None of the things that they try and paint everyone with. Now, what you're talking about in the lab is what's often described as the gain of function um, thing. So where they actually give it a little bit extra, supercharge it so that it can infect a little bit better. Is that correct, Professor? Yeah, look, um, you know, there's been debate around the, the, the benefits and risks of, of gain-of-function research on, on viruses for for a long, long time. It, it, it's gone back and forward. You know, there, there's two groups, I guess, of, of camps, um, particularly within science. There, there's one group that says, you know, to protect humanity against future pandemics, um, we should be almost creating um, pandemic viruses ourselves to explore, you know, what nature might do. Um, and, and they are the, the people who are pro what we call gain of function research. In other words, making a virus much more dangerous than it currently is, with, uh, you know, to understand how viruses in the future may become more dangerous. So you're creating the monster that you're trying to avoid. And, and there's a risk in doing that. So, so yes, there may be a benefit um, of, of more, you know, understanding better how viruses evolve to become pandemic viruses. But at the same time, there's a very significant risk. Um, you, you are creating the monster you, you, you want to avoid. And if something goes wrong and, you know, things do go wrong in laboratories, humans are humans, human error is, is, is everywhere. Um, and so it is possible if you create a pandemic virus in a lab that that will get out of the lab, um, either by infecting one of the, the staff working with it um, or even in the waste disposal system where, you know, you, you're discarding all of these, this virus that you've created, um, you know, you try to incinerate it or kill it. Um, but we know that, you know, again, equipment fails, um, you know, incinerators fail, um, or humans put the wrong waste in the wrong bin. Uh, and that's the bin that doesn't go to the incinerator, it just goes to the tip where there's lots of wild animals that now might scrummage around, you know, the carcasses of the rats that were used in the experiment and, and get infected and, hey, presto. So, so you know, yeah, you know, we shouldn't pretend that gain-of-function research is all benefit, no risk. It, it, it has very significant risks that have to be managed. It may or may not have a benefit because to this day, 
you know, not a single vaccine has been developed based on gain of function research. So, which is always the promise. They say we can develop a vaccine before the pandemic by doing gain of function research. Well, I'm a vaccine developer and my specialty is pandemic vaccines. And as I say, there is no example of how, where gain of function research has helped me or anyone else in my field to develop a pandemic vaccine. So, so you know, it, it's if we're going to do that type of research, it has to be incredibly well managed and regulated and monitored. And we know that unfortunately that wasn't happening in China. The Chinese government themselves have admitted that there were massive holes in their processes. Um, and, and they're now trying to tighten them up. But, but what it does say is, one, we need to consider, do we need that research at all? You know, um, but if, if we decide, yes, we should still do it, we need to have very solid international frameworks around it. It's not something that we should trust an, a national government to, to, to police. It's a bit like, you know, nuclear proliferation. Um, we need global treaties. So, you know, when something does go wrong, which may have happened here, you know, we all have a right to, to demand that, for instance, China, um, you know, be very open and, and let us investigate what happened. And that's not happening because at the moment, you know, gain of function research is only nationally regulated, which means if it happens in China, China can, can mm. stop anyone going in and looking at how did this happen, what happened, you know, was it a lab leak or wasn't a lab leak, they, they have complete autonomy because there is no treaty really covering this type of research. So, so what it says is, yes, if we're going to do this type of research, we need to, to have global treaties, processes, and, and we need to regulate it um, very carefully. Now, it seems one of the biggest uh, problems we had was the collision between science and bureaucrats. So instead of science leading the bureaucrats to the best path, it seemed like we had the bureaucrats dictating to the scientists what outcomes they they wanted them to produce. We've seen um, correspondence now between government ministers saying, let's hold back uh, this information on the new variant so we can scare them into um, complying with our orders. We, we need to pump it up and make it even worse to get more compliance rather than being factual. We've seen APRA just threatening doctors not to be able to, uh, their patient uh, doctor, you know, privilege their, their informed consent, all of that go out the window. We've seen the former head of the AMA and a ministerial uh, a politician saying that now her wife and herself were suffering serious vaccine injury while still pushing mandates. How do we stop this happening again, Professor? Because this is as certain as, as you know, day comes after night if we don't do something now. Yeah, look, um, yeah, I think that that's really a, a critical point um, because this is not unfortunately going to be the last pandemic. Um, and... You know the 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 failure to follow process, and and it's it's sort of an argument of of does the ends justify the means? Now now I was always taught, and and you know if you look at any of the public health textbooks, will tell you that that tricking people or lying to people in the hope that that will have a public health benefit will always backfire. You know, because you you know, once people realise they've been tricked, yes, it might work initially. Pretend this is really serious; they'll behave in a particular way that you want them. That may be beneficial in the short term, but when they realise, when the population realises that public health professionals and politicians completely lied to them to trick them into behaving in a particular way, they will never listen to those people for the rest of their lives. And so the consequences of lying to the public, even if you think it's a good thing at the time, is never a good thing. And, and how this group of people deluded themselves and ignored all the learnings of, of really hundreds, if not thousands of years of public medicine, that, you know, lying does not work. 
it may work, you know, in the very short term, but but the consequences, the damage goes on for lifetimes. Um, you know, I mean, yeah, the, it, it, it's, it, it, well, it, you just can't put words to it because it, it's it's people who, who the public, you know, are, are putting total trust in lying to their faces and yeah. and you could see you know, even if you even if they're justifying it themselves saying i'm lying to people you know it, it's a bit like saying um there's cyanide in sugar um you know to the population like we found all sugar is contaminated with cyanide now you're lying i mean it's not true but but you know people will will respond to that and they'll stop eating sugar and avoid sugar and that will reduce the amount of diabetes so you as a as the person you know the public health person you're saying look I, this this is a good lie um you know because i'm going to reduce the diabetes in in the community by just absolutely lying to people and telling them there's their cyanide contaminating all the sugar i mean you know so you so say you have you know but when you look at it from a, a higher perspective you say no that's just criminal behavior that that should result in that person being locked up, not not being respected as a public health clinician. Yes, you know maybe there will be a potential benefit, but but they're ignoring the fact that 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 one it, it's it's not truthful. It's 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 dishonest. You know what I mean? Um, you can't you can't practice medicine through dishonesty. I mean, if every doctor thought you know I'm, I'm just going to lie to all my patients and 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 try it that will help hopefully keep them more healthy i mean i think it, i would hope everyone on this planet would agree that 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 is that is just you know not the right thing to do you know even if there, there could be a potential benefit you know it's unacceptable yeah. um and you know particularly for people who are held in positions of trust yeah, you know they 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 cannot get away with lying, and yet that's what we've seen repeatedly over the last three years. I mean, lies about you know vaccines stopping transmission, lies about vaccines stopping people getting infected, um, you know, lies about you know having a vaccine protects your your loved ones. Yeah. Scientifically, it's 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 all one big lie. Um, it must have and felt yeah, like you were screaming into the void. Thinking it's reasonable. Yeah, it, and you could see the um, waning of it. To start with lockdown, we all complied. We're all in it together. And then by the end of it, even wearing a mask became a step too far. Um, so not a great imposition compared to what was originally happening in the first lockdown, but they had lost that trust. And then they started with the shame. If you don't do it, you're going to kill your granny. If you don't do it, your kids are going to get sick. It's the greater good. We're all in it together. And then we started with the name calling. The anti-vaxxers become the cookers and the right-wing nut jobs. And the government actually worked to turn each other against, it, people against each other, just for having genuine questions. But then when you looked at some of the things, when we look back, the government you could go for a walk for one hour, but you couldn't stop and sit on a park bench. The fleeting transmission. We're just walking past someone in a shopping centre. You could walk into a restaurant, had to wear your mask. You'd sit down at the table and take your mask off. You could go in an aeroplane. You had to wear your mask, but you could take your mask off to eat. It's just some of this stuff. Yeah, when it, it, back, it, 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 was, it, was, it was theatrical drama. Right. There's no science whatsoever to support any of it. And and these people must know. I mean, I know. We, we, we're part of a community. I mean, the masks don't work, um, particularly, you know, cloth masks have zero effect. Um, even the surgical masks, you know, may or may not have a, you know, it's, it's an immaterial um, effect if there is an effect. Um, and that's, that's assuming you're wearing it perfectly. And you're not touching it, you're not doing any of these things. But as you say, when you then get into theatre of, well, a mask doesn't work anyway, but we're also going to pretend it does, but, but you know, you don't transmit while you're eating food. Um, but, but while you're not eating food, of course, you know, you, you are transmitting, you have to put it back on and it will do something. I mean, all complete utter nonsense, which the, the average person must get. 
that this was theatrical drama, you know, to, to make people do things um, that weren't actually helping them, wasn't actually stopping the pandemic or reducing, but, you know, it made politicians feel important. It meant they could spend billions of dollars on buying masks, presumably from close friends um, who had the contracts, let's be honest. Um, you know, the pandemic has been a great mechanism to transfer billions of dollars of taxpayer funding to very privileged people. Um, I suspect those privileged people, uh, you know, have close connections um, with the government who were making those decisions, none of it being reviewed because it was all secret. None of these contracts have ever seen the light of day. Um, they've not been scrutinised. Um, there was no competitive bidding. Fantastic opportunity to, to make all your friends rich if you're in that position of power. Um, and so, you know, yeah, was the whole mask thing just a mechanism for transferring you know, funds um, to close friends. Yeah. I, I, you know, some people would, would, I'm sure, say, yes, that's that's the most likely explanation for why they did it. Um, had nothing to do with public health because we know the science says <laughs> this isn't going to have a public health benefit. Yeah, and now we're dealing with the unintended consequences the, the mental health, the school refusal in children's, the economic impact that all of this has had. And then when we compare it, um, some of the health outcomes, we've got the impacted um, cancer diagnosis where screening was stopped. We even stopped breast screening where we know just mathematically for every so many screens that are done, there are so many cases. Well, that screening stopped. So those cases will only be further down the track and possibly worsened outcomes. And so this is going to reverberate. It's like ripples in a pond. These ripples are going to continue out for a long time before they dissipate completely. Absolutely. And, and that's why I say that whenever you make a, a public health decision, you know, you're meant to look not just at the potential positives, but everything comes at a price. I mean, whether it's the price of a mask or, or a vaccine, but, but also, you know, the damage um, uh, that can be done and not just physical damage, but psychological damage, as you say, educational damage, um, damage to families, to relationships, to trust in government. I mean, it, you know, as you say, we know of this because public health people have been debating, you know, risk and benefit of these measures for, for, you know, as long as, as I've been doing medicine and, and I'm sure way back even to the Greeks, that, you know, they understood that you can't do a, something in public health without, you know, having negative consequences and they must always be less than the benefit. Um, in this case, they pretended there were no negative consequences of anything they were doing. Um, you know, that doesn't get you past, you know, 101 of public health um you know these people shouldn't be in the jobs they are to be frank um because they they completely failed to consider the negative consequences of any of these actions um and you know again that 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 was irresponsible and they continue to be irresponsible because some of them are still sticking to, to those positions today, three years in, when the, the evidence is overwhelmingly that none of these things had any impact whatsoever in terms of positive health impact, but there were enormous negative impacts, which, as you say, we're only just starting to, to tease out. And, and you know, we're going to, I think, see more and more evidence of damages, massive damages, um, taken by these arbitrary decisions um, that were not backed by science, that were not supported by, by you know, knowledge from, from dealing with past pandemics, but they just, just, just decided, you know, on a whim, I'm going to impose this, you know, mandate or I'm going to, you know, impose a lockdown and, you know, just for the hell of it. I mean, again, there was no science. And, and this is one of the few... This is one of the few examples that I can see of where um, the disadvantaged countries have actually done better because of their disadvantaged 
than um, first world countries with their affluence being able to vaccinate everyone. And we seem to be having more unintended consequences here. When we look at Africa, I think they had about a 5% vaccination rate. Well, they're going along as per pre-vaccine, uh, pre-pandemic, whereas we're still copying the uh, unintended consequences. Absolutely. And I, I think, as you say, that that is one of the grand ironies. They didn't bankrupt their countries spending, you know, hundreds of, of billions of dollars on these interventions. Um, and yet, you know, for all intents and purposes, the impact on their public health has been certainly no greater than, than ourselves. Um, but arguably, they've, they've, they may have done even better. I mean, it's always hard because of the quality of the data to make direct comparisons because, you know, there's lots of confounders. But, but overall, you would have to say, I mean, those, those poor countries have not been wiped out by COVID. You know, I mean, which was what we were told is that, you know, the whole population were going to die unless, you know, we had lockdowns and, you know, we, we had mask mandates and we had vaccine mandates and, you know, we spent hundreds of billions of dollars on this. Um, it wasn't true. And as I say, as you say, the truth is the countries that couldn't afford to do any of that, so they didn't, and have come through this, you know, uh, relatively unscarred, you would say, and, and probably still with confidence in their their politicians and their, their health systems, which, uh, you know, I don't think uh, we, we have so much here. I think there's a lot of loss of confidence um, in, in our public health decision makers as a consequence of what happened over the last three years in Australia. Definitely. The, the next public health message I don't think is going anywhere. Anyway, we've got to leave it there, Professor. It's always fascinating and I can't wait to chime in again and uh, have another chat. It's always a pleasure.